What's up everyone? Welcome to Hustle is for Life Motivation. You are here because you are curious, you are a hustler and you want to know what it takes to create holistic success in your life. My job is to bring on amazing guests on the show so we can dive deep into their lives and their minds and learn from them. Learn from what strategies they have used to, in order to create holistic success in their lives. Now, today I have a very special guest with me. He is uh, an amazing, amazing person. He is an international best-selling author. He is a speaker. He is actually an award-winning TEDx speaker. And uh, he is the host of the radio show called Conversation with Passion. Um, and uh, he travels all over the world. He's been on the show before. He's a returning guest. He needs no introduction. He is Corey Poirier. Corey, thanks for being here. Really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. Oh, thank you so much, Lal. It's my pleasure and uh, I enjoyed the last time and I know I'm going to enjoy this time as well. Absolutely. But guys, before we actually dive deep into this interview, quick question. Have you ever had to deliver a presentation? Have you ever had to maybe deliver a talk at work? Maybe you were asked to do a speech at your local community center regarding a project. Maybe you had to stand up in front of your work colleagues and tell them about how you conducted yourself when you were you know, dealing with a certain aspect of your job. How did that feel like? Were you comfortable standing in front of everybody? Were you okay? Did you know how to design your presentation, how to convey your message well? Are you good at public speaking? That's the bottom line. Are you good at public speaking? Because Corey's just launched his new book called The Book of Public Speaking. And it's, it's just incredible. I've read it. He's interviewed some really top thought leaders. And the great thing about the book is that it just doesn't talk about some tips, some general advice that you can get off blogs, that you can get off you know, Google. No, this is very specific because it gives you a system. If you want to be a speaker, a paid speaker, you want to build it into a business. You want to be in the speaking business, or if you want to promote your business through your public speaking, then this is the book for you. It's a step-by-step -step guide. It's phenomenal. So all the links will be below in the description. Check them out. But Corey, tell us about the book. What inspired you to write that book? Because I know you are an award-winning TEDx speaker. You've delivered multiple talks. You travel all over the world talking on different things. You've been on shows. You've been on podcasts. So what inspired you to actually share all those insights and especially those, those, that, the step-by-step -step system where you talk about how to build a business. So first of all, thank you. It's so humbling. Uh, your, you know, your kind assessment of the book as well. Um, but I guess what inspired me twofold one, cause I, I feel the book is a unique approach that I don't see every day. And, and what I mean by that, it, you tie, you tied it into it when you mentioned interviews. So we, we put, took a different, format with the book. That was important to me. Um, and then I'll talk about what drove me to put the book out. But the format for those that haven't grabbed it yet, basically the first section, uh, smaller section is me, as you said, revealing my system, revealing the approach I've taken, and some strategies you can apply every day. The second uh, section is actually a, a section with interviews. So where we uh, basically reveal what I learned, it was, it's transcribed interviews essentially with the likes of Tom Ziegler, uh, so the proud son of Zig Ziglar, Coach Jim Johnson, who I know uh, you've had on the show, and uh, and basically revealing those uh, their insights in a Q and A type format, which I think is unique in a book like this. And then section three is insights and quotes by other speakers and or people that are starting in their speaking journey, explaining why they love speaking. So I just wanted to tell people that's the format. So I think that makes it unique from most books. Mm. And in fact, I remember one review I had the person that was why she didn't like the book. You know, she's looking at. I just want straight, you know, chapters one to 10 and, and step one to step two. But then I had many people, um, you know, even in the reviews, but many people in general say they like the fact that it was different, as you said, in the time when we can get that other stuff on blogs or elsewhere. So that's the, you know, the how the book looks and format. Why or what the catalyst was is that people ask me all the time. And I'm talking now, it's, it's on a weekly basis at least, I get one of two questions. One is when we've talked about how to land a TEDx talk. That's become my new question over the last year and a half. The second question, which started before the year and a half and continues, is how can I learn, earn a living speaking? Mm. And or the secondary question is, if I don't want to get paid to speak, how can I still use speaking as a platform 
to grow my business or to earn an income or to, you know, even earn a, a supplemental income. And so because I keep getting those two questions, I decided I would answer the main question about how to speak for impact and money. So speak for impact and fees, we'll call it. I decided to put a book together that would answer that question, but also demystify the speaking business a little bit. So my hopes with those interviews is they were getting to hear from people who either watch speakers our speakers themselves, they're getting to hear directly, here's what I like in a speaker. Here's what I've noticed other speakers do really well. Here's what I've done that's worked for me. Here's strategies I've seen, like Tom Ziegler shared one about, if you, I don't know if you remember this one thing, he talked about this um, speaker who basically has evaluation forms or handouts and he gets yes. people to write down their phone number. Yeah. And yeah. he actually calls every person that puts their number down and says, hey, it's Jim, motivational speaker. And I don't remember the name, but uh, just wanted to check in and make sure you enjoyed the talk. Is there anything I could have helped with? And that guy gets most of his paid bookings from that one action. Well, what my point is, if I just did a, a standard book, a standard formatted book, you wouldn't have got that because that was something that came out when I asked Tom about speakers that he, I, he look, looks up to and what has he seen speakers do that made them stand out. Mm. So again, the catalyst was to teach people the craft of speaking, but the reason I took the approach I did was because I wanted to make it so that it was very, as you said, you can learn about being a speaker almost by living through these interviews rather than having to go page by page on a blog or in a speaking book and read simply try this, do this, try this, do this, try this. I just wanted it to be different. Mm, yeah. The, why was because clients were asking me how. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you know what? That's actually a very sort of um, abst abstract sort of idea for most people as in how do you actually become a paid speaker or how do you actually build a business behind you know your public speaking or how do you actually are able to land a TEDx talk like things like that they're like almost like well hidden secrets and, and people are very curious like how some people have access to all these things and other people have just absolutely no clue by the way I'm one of those people <laughs> I have just no clue right um, but it, it, it's fantastic. The book is absolutely amazing. And, and for people in the audience, I will highly encourage you to go check it out. Like regardless of whether you're delivering presentations at work, regardless of whether you're actually trying to, you know, build a business from your public speaking, or you want to just promote your business by getting different speaking engagements. The, the book is phenomenal. And, and there's some the interviews with like top thought leaders in there, which will really help you understand how other people have essentially succeeded in uh, you know leveraging public speaking into becoming a business or or getting their promoting their business so Corey I mean here's the thing you started your public speaking journey in a comedy club yes right okay I, I love that story by the way I mean you shared that in the book but it, it's just so unique of a story um, that I, I think many people will will find it quite interesting and amusing at the same time but it, it's such an amazing story of how you actually you know were trying to become a stand-up comedian and that led you down this journey of you know becoming a very successful public speaker and building a business behind it so can you talk to us a little bit about you know how did you get started how did that night at the comedy club you know, which, which essentially could be considered as a failure led you to down this path. And now you are a very, very successful speaker and you travel all over the world delivering different talks. Yeah. So the, the story you're talking about is sort of in some ways become a signature story for me. I share it at the beginning of a lot of my talks and I think it, it sort of warms the audience up because it sort of puts the pie in my face. And I think anytime we can be humble enough to share our vulnerability, we pull people in. And so that story, it really has me really vulnerable because um, it was all, every bit of it was for lack of a better way of saying it, either embarrassing or humiliating at the time. But in hindsight now, it's, it's become a defining moment of my life. I realized how significant it was. So um, to explain it to people, basically I started performing uh, stand up comedy because I had a stage play in a fringe fest. So a stage play that I wrote and directed, and I was kind of forced into acting in the play because one of the, the lead actor actually sprained his ankle. And because I needed to allow for time changes for him to get backstage to change his costumes, I had to add in a character. And I was the only person that knew the lines of the play. So even though I didn't want to be on stage, I had to write myself a character. And I walked in with my back to the audience and back off the same way so that nobody could see my face. But I realized at the same time, I need to work on this. 
because it's not good if I'm wanting to be a writer and a director uh, creating my own stuff if I can't get in front of an audience and share through my own vision. And so what happened was I, um, I, I finished out the play, four days of me basically with my back to the audience. I didn't conquer any fears that way. But one of the actors from the play said, hey, I heard about this local stand-up comedy workshop at a university. How would you like to give it a try? And I said, that sounds absolutely terrifying. You know, the number one fear in the world above death is public speaking. And, um, and I always add this in and tell people this, but Jerry Seinfeld, as a comedian, they said, what that means is for the average person, if you were at a funeral, you'd rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy. Mm. You know, that's how your fear is of speaking. And so, yeah. um, so I was faced with this idea. I went through a workshop for two weeks of stand-up, and then week number three, I was told I was going to be entertained uh, by other people, other comedians, and we were going to study what they shared up from the stage and then talk about it and learn from that. But what happened is uh, about five minutes to showtime, we recognized that there were no comics in the audience yet, no comics in the, in the room, and yet we had filled the place because we did all the marketing with audience members. And so we asked the guy that got us in there, his name was Guy, in fact, we asked him, Guy, where are the entertainers? And at that moment we realized we were the entertainers. He kind of pointed <laughs> to us and said, you're looking at him. And so we found out with about five minutes to showtime type notice, we were the entertainers. No time for material, getting ready, nothing. I, uh, I went into uh, the bathroom trying to find an exit window. Um, there were 15 of us, eight left at the front door. Came back out, there's seven left. And so what happened was um, I had been to Toastmasters and learned that if you're going to face a fear like speaking, try it first, go up first. Mm -hmm. So I jumped on the stage, told my uh, two jokes that I kind of thought were the best jokes that I had ever written in my life. I told those two jokes to dead silence. And now the streams of sweat start coming down my face and, you know, all the things you hear about stand up. I was going through those motions standing on a stage. And then finally guy calls me over to the corner of the stage and gives me one of those schmucks in the back of the head. And he said, you idiot, we haven't even turned the mic on yet. <laughs> wow. And so you knew where that story I think was leading, but basically um, I told two jokes, mic turned off, bombed horribly. And I, I, I often, I just start now to share this part of the story because people always ask, well, how did it go later? How did it go afterward? And the truth is we turned the mic back on. I started up again and told the same two jokes and they bombed again. So I can jokingly, but honestly say, I'm probably one of the few comics that's ever delivered the same material twice in a row in less than 10 minutes and bombed both times. <laughs> so that was my experience. And so basically that was, we would call probably, a, a, most people would call that, a, as you said, a, a humongous, I would say a massive failure. And uh, what happened though, is I kept going back. That was mm -hmm. the only difference between me and other people that probably had that same failure who chalked it up to a bad night and never went back. I kept going back week after week trying to get better. And I kept bombing too, which is a lot of people would think, oh, well, I'm sure after two or three weeks, he'd start knocking it out of the park. No, I bombed week after week after week after week, kept going back. And then slowly you get like one joke that got a laugh, two jokes that got a laugh in a night. And that was like stri striking gold. Mm. Uh, but then what happened after uh, a certain amount of time, I realized that a lot of what I liked about stand-up, I could get by being a speaker. And I could also avoid a lot of what I didn't like about stand-up. And so I began to make the transition over to speaking, even though I kept doing stand-up for a lot of years after. And so, yeah, so that, that's how I launched into speaking. But interestingly, that failure, the fact that I survived on the stage that night, like literally didn't die because everybody said, oh, you're going to die up there. I literally didn't die. That told me it wasn't the end of the world. The worst that could happen happened, and I, did, and I survived it. So that mm. did one thing for me. And then the second thing is, uh, because I started in stand-up, speaking was not easy, but it was slightly easier, meaning to do stand-up is harder than speaking. So because I was doing stand-up all the time and bombing, and then I had an audience members that, you know, they didn't care if I failed or not in the stand-up club, what happened, I discovered in the corporate world, is they were rooting for you to succeed. So I was able to use what I learned in stand-up to allow me to transition easier into speaking, but I wouldn't have continued with either of them had I not went on that stage and realized oh my God, the worst happened and it still wasn't that bad. So that's a long way to say, that's kind of how I got into speaking and the stand-up was a big catalyst and also a reason for me surviving and speaking as well. Yeah, it's such a tremendous story. I absolutely love it. Um, and for people in the audience, I'm, I'm going to ask you right now, has that ever happened to you? Where you were standing in a room in front of a group of people and you were trying to tell them something, 
you were trying to maybe deliver a talk or a presentation and you bombed. You couldn't remember what to say next. Your mind just went blank. How scary was that? <laughs> All right. And then Corey actually went back. I mean, that happened to him at, at the comedy club. But guess what? He just he went back. He didn't just run away. And to be honest, Corey, I mean, in the story, you know, I think there were 20 of you at the start. And when they heard that you will be the ones who will be, you know, uh, who are the comedians, who are the entertainers for the night. I'm sorry, I'm getting a notification for some reason. Right. Let's get rid of that. Um, so when when people found out that they are you guys are going to be the entertainers for the night a lot of the people actually ran away so they were like in the end i think like five or six of you left right uh fairly close it was uh 15 showed up and right. eight so wow. over, over 50 percent walked out significance of that as well though talal is that out of those eight that are out of all the 15 but including the eight that left most of them were actors in like film and stuff so they were in the entertainment business so this wasn't like somebody who didn't know they were going to go down that path. And mm. secondly, uh, we paid for the workshop. So they paid to go and they showed up that night and they were in the, the entertainment business in some capacity and they still left. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, like you said, like, you know, public speaking is like the number one fear in the world. You know, even, even like death is number two, right? Death is number two and, and public speaking is the number one fear in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's, it's crazy. And, and the irony, like I say, is that stand up, and I guess I didn't say Ed this, but stand up is actually even a bigger fear than speaking. But mm. so few people will ever try it, they just lump it in with speaking. But yeah. stand up's worse because obviously getting in front of an audience and speaking is terrifying for most people, but at least the audience is usually rooting for you to succeed. Mm. In stand up, even if you fail, that's still a good night for the audience member. Are you right? It's still a show. So anyway, yeah, so it's, so stand up is, yeah, it's not, it's certainly not for the faint at heart, but you can't get a better learning ground if mm. you want to launch into speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Corey, I mean, not just the fact that you are a, a award winning speaker yourself and not only the fact that you go around delivering talks all over the world, but you actually have your own programs. You have the speaking program where you actually help other people develop their public speaking skills. And you also have the TEDx talk uh, program where you actually help people, you know, get, get, get a chance to go and deliver a TEDx talk, which is absolutely fantastic. So my question really is the fact that, you know, you've trained so many people, hundreds of thousands of people in both of those programs. Do you think that a good speaker is somebody who's just born? So somebody's born a good speaker, or is that something that takes practice and patience and effort and can be cultivated over time? So, I, I, so I'm going to say this, uh, you know, I don't, I don't speak in absolutes very often. People will, will tell you that I, when I, somebody asks me a question, usually I say it depends because mm -hmm. I, I don't believe there's very many absolutes, but here's one thing I can tell you. It, 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 what is it? Oprah used to say one thing I know for sure. So this is an absolute because I know, because I learned, I lived it. That's how I can say it's an absolute. So my answer is you ask, are we born speakers or can you learn it basically? And the answer is yes, you can learn it. And the reason I know that is because I wasn't born a speaker. And how do I know that? It's because I told you about my stand-up experience. That was my first time on a real stage with a mic. And you could say, well, that was just a, you, an experience, a bad night, whatever, that's fine. But previous to that, my, my first sort of two talks in, in public, uh, I don't remember a word of what I said. I didn't prepare. I didn't know you were supposed to. I, um, I, I, one of them I said to the person I knew that was in the room, I said, what did I say? And the guy said, I have no clue what you were talking about, but you were so excited saying it, you sold me. <laughs> but the point is, I didn't, rem I didn't remember what I said. That's how bad I was. Uh, next time I was covered in sweat and I was just a you know, mess. Like I couldn't, I, my whole talk didn't have any kind of synergy to it or through line at all. So I can answer with absolute certainty that you can learn to speak. I mean, you could even maybe make the argument that I was born to become a speaker because you could argue destiny and all that stuff. But what I'm suggesting is even if so, one thing I can say for a fact is that I learned the craft of speaking. Hmm. So my answer is, can you learn the craft of speaking? Yes. And how do I know? Because I did. I learned as somebody who wasn't meant to be, you know, at least wasn't uh, born with this unique ability. I wasn't born with the comfort to be on a stage. I wasn't born with the ability to speak off the cuff. I wasn't born to, with the ability to stand up there for an hour and have a crafted message. So to me, if I can learn all those things, then you can learn to be a speaker, much the same way I believe that you can learn to become a salesperson. 
Mm. I, I, I think, but I'll, I'll go one step further. I do believe some people are born naturally more inclined to be able to speak comfortably on stage, to knock it out of the park right from their first talk. I believe that some people are better at sales, they're more charismatic right from the get-go. But I also believe like the 10,000 hour rule, I believe that anybody if they put in the time can learn those crafts. And if I didn't, I wouldn't be teaching people, right? I wouldn't be teaching people how to, how to grow a speaking business because if we all were just comfortable doing it, there wouldn't be a need for the teaching. So yeah, I believe you can learn for sure. Mm, excellent. That's good news for people in the audience, by the way. I'm, I'm sure that people got that confidence to, uh, that they will be able to go and, and develop that skill. But I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm going to put myself in the shoes of some of the audience members. And some of them will be thinking, well, Corey, that's great. But don't you think you have to be an extrovert? You need to have a, be a certain personality type to go and you know, develop that speaking skills. You need to be an extrovert naturally. So you are able to connect with people. You find it easy to go and talk to people rather than being an introvert where you are a little bit shy and reserved. So what advice do you have for those people? So, well, the good news is, I, the, my first part is I don't believe you have to be an extrovert. I believe, so I'll say it this way again, it's beneficial if you already have that. I mean, obviously, if you can communicate to a lot of people, one to many easily, or if you are more comfortable being in crowds, then clearly you're going to be a better, you know, a not better speaker, but you're clearly going to be start out a lot more comfortable, mm. which makes the whole process easier for you. But I don't believe you have to be. And, you know, and I, I, this is me reaching. So I'm not going to say this is a fact. This is my, so I want to make it clear. This is my assumption, but I assume uh, I probably a lot of the listeners and viewers would know who Seth Godin is. Yeah. Uh, and so wrote the purple cow and uh, the dip and a whole bunch of uh, tribes, a whole bunch of books on passive marketing and how you can draw people to you. And I'm going to guess, I don't know this for a fact, but based on the his way he delivers his talks, the way he writes his books, I think Seth Godin's probably an introvert. That's a guess. I don't know that for a fact, uh, but I think he probably is. And if he is, there's a classic example of somebody who's crushed it in the world of speaking and in the world of marketing being an introvert. And again, I'm just reading based on what I see on the outside. But I can also tell you that I've worked with introverts who end up being very good analytical speakers, meaning a lot of times, or not a lot of times, sometimes extroverts are type A, like me, type A personalities, and we're expressive and all that kind of stuff. And we're sort of all over the place where an inch and you know, we're um, visionary, let's say where we want to say, here's how, here's what we could do if we tried hard. But the, the introvert talks about the uh, analytics of how, how it actually can work. Mm. And so I think an introvert can have skills that an extrovert can't and vice versa. But I do believe that both can make for great speakers. I think both can learn the craft of speaking. Uh, what I will say is, and this is, uh, a lot of people probably won't believe me when I say this, but my girlfriend could at least back this up. In certain aspects of my life, I'm an extrovert, no question. In other aspects of my life, I'm an introvert. And I believe there's a lot of us out there. And when I say that, here's what I'm meaning is whenever I'm flying, which I do all the time, I'm not the guy that sits next to you at the seat and says, Hey, how are you doing? What's your name? Oh my God, here's my business card. We should chat. I'm the person that typically is like typing on my computer, keeping to myself. Whenever I, if I go, um, if I, once I get home from the road, I'm not the person that reaches out to all my friends and say, let's go out and have a party Friday. I'm not that guy mm. after being on the road and being social with clients and speaking at the event and talking to people afterwards. And in some cases being with the client for two days straight, whenever I get back to my hotel or whenever I get home, I'm that person that kind of shies away. Mm. So I believe that's the introvert in me. Does that mean I'm an, an introvert in general? No, I think I, I have the extrovert uh, skills and the extrovert personality for sure. I think I just happen to have both. Now my mother is, um, you know what? I would say my mother's probably a bit of both as well. And my girlfriend is, but then I have people I know in my life that are always on and they're extroverts. No question. They're always an extrovert. Uh, when they get home, they want they're right away. They want to reach out to people and say, we got to do something tonight. I'm not that guy. I'm not the life of the party either. So I don't know if that sort of answers it, but the fact that I have introvert in me and still can get up on a stage tells me that what I'm saying is from firsthand experience. I'm probably like, 60 40 60 percent extrovert but i still have a lot of introvert in me and so i've worked with introverts who are i'm going to say almost completely introverted who speak 
I've worked with extroverts who are completely extroverts and speak, and I'm a bit of both, and I know a lot of people who are a bit of both that have found a way to get on the stage and deliver as well. So I don't, so I guess that's a long way to say I think any, it doesn't matter uh, if you're an introvert or an extrovert, it matters how far you're willing to put yourself out there, and do you have somebody to guide you through it, and are you willing to take action? Mm, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's, that's really good advice uh, for people, simply because it, it is a big thing for people who are introverts and they think, well, how am I ever going to become a great speaker? Because, you know, when you think of great speakers, you think of, you know, famous people like John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King or, you know, the Brian Tracy's of the world or the Tony Robbins of the world. And they have a lot of charisma. Absolutely. Right. And it seems like they're just like natural extroverts. They're just born that way. Right. Absolutely. Here's now here's something, though, um, we can consider. I mean, obviously, he was a public figure. But if you look at how he's a public figure, I think we could read into it that he maybe like me, maybe even more of an introvert than me, is Steve Jobs. Mm. You know, Steve Jobs is in most surveys I see about best speakers in the world. Steve Jobs is over and over again, voted, was voted the best presenter. Yet Steve Jobs, how many people have done a personal interview with him? You can almost count them in your hand. Like he was a very much a, a reclusive in a lot of ways. And the meetings he would have would only be with like, you know, the top executive of another company to put something together for Apple. But for the most part, you didn't see, you didn't see pictures of him out socializing and hanging out. So it seemed like he worked really hard. And plus he was a tech guy, right? He was an IT guy too. But he would work really hard, they say, for like six months on a presentation. Closed door meeting, like closed door by himself working on the presentation. If he was an extrovert, he would have been bringing people in and saying, what do you think of this? He did worked on his own, didn't want anybody to interrupt him. Then he got on stage, delivered this massive presentation, then disappeared into the darkness again. So, you know, there's an example of somebody who had lots of charisma, but I really believe was an introvert. Whereas, as you mentioned, Tony Robbins, everything I've ever seen leads me to believe he's an extrovert. Mm. Yeah. So I just, but I, but I will say that some of the best presenters, I believe, um, are truly introverts. And I, I also feel, like I say, there are skills that introverts have that an extrovert could never replicate and that would actually serve them really well during a talk. And again, an extrovert could never do it. So I think both works. Mm. And th th to your point though, Talal, as far as that charisma, I think that's another thing that can be, I don't wanna say manufacture, but I think you can develop and improve your level of charisma. I believe you can, become more attractive to people. I think you can, you know, as an example is, anybody who has found their purpose is gonna be more attractive to people who haven't, than people, you know, that who haven't, to others. And so, um, I think Steve Jobs, that's why, you know, he was so charismatic, is because he was living on purpose. Tony Robbins, no question, that dude's living on purpose. And so, for an introvert, I would say, here's your tip, live on purpose and people are gonna read that you're speaking from your heart. Secondly, I would say, uh, and this is not a cheap plug, but one of my TEDx talks is uh, called, roughly, expanding your or crushing your fears and expanding your comfort zone. And the premise, I take you through in 18 minutes, how to get outside your comfort zone. And I would say more than extroverts, introverts should watch that video, and it'll at least tell them how to overcome this fear of getting on a stage in the first place. Mm, yeah, uh, and, you know, the, the example you used with Steve Jobs is, is, a, is a great example, I think, of somebody who's an introvert but still crushed it as, as, a, as a public speaker. Um, I, I have to say that, you know, in, in the book, you, use some, um, you share some amazing strategies of uh, putting together the structure of a speech and how to construct your story, etc. which, by the way, I've used for two of my Toastmaster speeches, and I won the award of the best speaker of the evening just using those strategies. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Okay. What, what strategies for that? What strategies for that, Paul? What oh. strategies? So you know that that mind map um, yes. strategy that you use. So you, for example, you put down the three main ideas that you want to talk about, the three stories uh, that we follow those three ideas, and then you develop that further. I, I use that for two of my Toastmaster speeches, and I won the award for the best speaker of the evening. Oh my God! Awesome stuff! Congrats! That's super cool. Yeah, thank That's you, brother. I appreciate that. But like, I I actually did. I followed that too. So the, yeah, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Oh my God. So cool. That's uh, that's, why I, that's why I do what I do. It's so humbling to hear a story like that. So thank you for sharing that. Cause I'm a, also, as I mentioned, Toastmaster earlier, I'm a big, uh, big fan of Toastmasters. It, you know, we're talking about uh, tips for people. That's a big tip. Join Toastmasters. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I will say that um, people ask me what I got from Toastmasters. I get rid of my ums and ahs 
after five years as a paid speaker, I was still doing ums and ahs. I go into Toastmasters for one, uh, well, multiple weeks, but one week, the first week, uh, I had the grammarian when I did my icebreaker, so like two minutes, said 14 ums and ahs. I'm like, what? <laughs> you get paid to do this, don't you? And it was embarrassing. And so the next time I was conscious of it, and all of a sudden it was like three ums and ahs. And then it was like one. And then all of a sudden for week after week, it was zero. And so I credit Toastmasters at, you know, what it worked out to probably about $10 a month or $5 a month of getting rid of my ums and ahs. So to all that was kind of a bonus if people, you know, people ask me all the time, where should I start? And I always say, for one thing, you should be in Toastmasters. Yeah, yeah. I, I told you. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you because it, it is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and in my case, it's not as much ums and ahs, although there's some of ums and ahs there. It's, you know. You know what I found? <laughs> you know, you know what I found? And then I guess that I, that's what we do that too, right? I said, you know what I found right yeah. after that. <laughs> what I discovered is that usually, I mean, I call it now a crutch word. And I did it in stand-up too. What, what I find is if you're delivering a talk for the first time, mm you're going to be more apt to use those words, the crutch words, because you don't know the talk as well. You're not as comfortable with it. So for example, whenever I used to do uh, with stand up, what I would do is I deliver this joke and even the ones that would get a laugh, my crutch word was anyway. So I would, it'd be new material I was trying out and I would deliver the joke and then I go anyway, but I, or I go anyway. And then I would like basically step on my own laugh because I was adding in a word when I was supposed to leave silence for them to laugh. But I, I discovered that I did it whenever I didn't know my talk or my, or my material very well. So it'd be like something I wrote a joke on the way there. And then if, I, if that happened for my whole set, I would be using anyway, because I was worried about that one joke that was 30 seconds. So how do you overcome that? My experience is you need to practice more. And it might, mm -hmm. it might be different talks, but ideally that talk, like if you're doing a talk for Toastmaster and it's a prepared speech, maybe it means you need to practice it 30 times rather than 10. But I found that those crutch words, that's how you get rid of them. And then also when the grammarian says, you, Talal, you said, you know, like 77 times, and you go, because <laughs> people, people are hearing that I said it 77 times. Uh, so yeah, so I, that, there's lots of amazing uh, media broadcasters that say um and ah, like, and you never notice it. It's not that there's people that speak and, and have the ums and ahs and they don't lose credibility. It's just for me, if I can get rid of it, why wouldn't I try? Why not try to improve my craft? Same with you know. A lot of people won't notice that. Not as much as you think they will, and not as much as you notice it. But why not try to work on, you know, in removing it, if you will. So anyway, so yeah, so it's kind of cool to hear, though, that you have your own sort of crutch word as well. I think most of us do. Yeah, yeah, we do. We, we need something to lean on at times when, when you're trying to say the next thing. But I think it's... The, the biggest part there is just being aware of it. And I think going to Toastmasters really make you aware of it. Absolutely. Well, like I said, my ums and ahs, that grammarian sure made me aware of it. You know, 17 ums and ahs. And, and that was just like, it was embarrassing. And, but I mean, it wasn't, it was embarrassing, but it was a good embarrassing because it made me aware of it and it made me conscious of it. And I had no idea. Now, the truth is I may not have been saying ums and ah, um and ah that ah, like that often. I may not have been doing it that much. I knew there's a grammarian counting me. So I may have said it more because I was more conscious of it. But one way or another, it was still a crutch I was using. So that was, it was important to get it out. And even if it was the embarrassment, maybe if the embarrassment wouldn't have been so big of that number, maybe if it would have been three, I would have just said, oh, well, that's not that big a deal. So it was designed to happen that way. But Toastmasters is a great learning ground. Much like stand-up comedy is a great learning ground. But most people won't try stand-up comedy. So if, you, if you're not willing to try stand-up like I did, go to Toastmasters. That's, I, I can't say enough about it. And the price is almost negligible. It's almost next to nothing. Yeah, yeah. For what you get in return is, is, is next to nothing. You're absolutely right. Um, Corey, you haven't just written this amazing book, which, by the way, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of. I absolutely love it. And I highly encourage all the people in the audience to go and check it out because maybe you haven't had a chance to deliver a speech or a talk yet uh, in your career, in your job or whatever, but then maybe later on you might have to, especially if you're hoping to progress, you want to go into su supervisor role or you want to progress into management or you're an entrepreneur, then, you know, you, you, there'll be a time where you have to deliver a talk to your team to, you know, uh, whether that is a board of directors, whatever, like you can craft the situation in your mind, but there will be a time in your life where you will have to do it. And Corey's book is just like full of golden nuggets and value and interviews with some really amazing thought leaders who have absolutely crushed it. And Corey, like I said, he's worked with hundreds of thousands of people in both his programs. Um, 
so Corey, actually, that's that's my next question. Actually, talk to us a little bit about your speaking program and the TEDx program, and who are they actually for? What kind of people should be looking to join those programs? No, thank you so much, Paul. And I will add too. You know, we were just saying Toastmasters is one starting point for people. Another starting point I recommend is watch videos by world-class speakers like a Steve Jobs and study what they do really well and emulate that. A third component is you were talking about my book and you know, it's important for me to mention as well with the book right now, it's, I haven't raised the price because I've just been too busy, which is a good thing, I guess. Um, but, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm glad that people can jump on it and grab it and save money. I'm not, you know, trying to make a mint off the book on its own. So um, I will say, I think the book, if, and I, I'd have to double check this, but I think uh, it's still on amazon.com for 99 cents. So wow. when we're talking about the book, people can still basically jump on and grab it for next to nothing. I think Canadians like a dollar fifty or something, um, or dollar thirty. So as far as uh, the programs themselves, though, we move over to that. So basically, again, how it was created is similar to the book. People kept asking me how to get paid to speak, and I knew the book was a way to to help people and guide people along that maybe weren't ready for the program yet. But the program is more of a I don't want to say hold your hand, but guide you along, be a support for you, launching your speaking career from basically never having spoken on a stage, but know you can do it. You know, it's a big part is you got to be able to get on a stage, but basically from the first day of your speaking journey, uh, or to people that are seasoned speakers, if you're new on your journey, I can help you avoid some of the bad habits and fall down the manholes that I fell down during that long of a career. Um, the other side of the other spectrum is people that have been speaking for 20 years that are struggling with getting bookings. They don't, you know, they don't have the extra, like, so in the, in the program, we reveal a lot of strategy for how to get bookings really quickly, how to get bookings easily, um, you know, how to get bookings simply by, if you have one talk booked, I reveal a way I use our strategy, I use it that one talk to then get another 15 or 20 people telling me they're looking for a speaker. So there's a lot of ways I take people through the speaking journey. You know, what, what kind of evaluation form you should hand out? Uh, and we provide that for you so you can, change it up as much as you want. The spider method you just mentioned for how do you mind map out your talk. Um, also, we also have um, contracts, so speaking agreements, so that you don't have to start from scratch with a speaking agreement. We have uh, questionnaires that I use. So I use questionnaires to customize it to the client. If, you know, if I reach out to a client or they reach out to me and I say, well, I want to customize to your audience, I send a questionnaire along that allows me to customize and on and on. So basically the program teaches you the speaking trade from start to finish. And again, like I said, there's people that are seasoned that come to me and say, I've been speaking for 20 years, but I'm still not making a living speaking. And we see that, I see that more often than you would think. Then the second part is the TEDx program, which is a totally different beast altogether. That's basically people that, and a lot of times seasoned speakers, but it can be somebody who hasn't spoken yet at all, but has an important message. But people come to me and say, I've always had a dream or I have a new dream of delivering a TEDx talk and getting on that stage help. And so this program is the help. It's the help people. What I'm going to call it is the shortcut to the process of securing a TEDx talk. So to put that in perspective, people don't realize the odds of getting a TEDx talk can be very slim. I say can be because it depends if you know somebody at a TEDx event, or if you're an alumni of a school putting on a TEDx event, your odds go up higher. Mm. Obviously, there's things that increase your odds. But if your, I mean, if your sister's planning the event, it's probably easier for you to get a talk or a booking, as long as they don't consider that a conflict of interest. But the flip side is, if you don't know anybody and you're starting from scratch, here's the raw numbers. The larger TEDx events like uh, LA, New York, what have you, will get 2,000 plus applicants for five to 10 spots on the stage. The smaller ones will get 200 applicants, let's say, the rural areas, for five to 10 spots. So if you crunch those numbers, that means your odds are one, less than 1%, to only as high as 10%. So you can take those odds, roll the dice, this is your one option, and go out there, put it out there, and try to book a talk. And that's the hard way, because you're gonna be, you might have to put in 10 applications before you even get a response. Uh, we have somebody, one of our students, who put in a bunch on her own, and I think she put in 10, and she, has, she said, I can't even get no's, I'm just getting no response. So she reached out to one, and they said, yeah, we typically don't reply if we're not gonna book you. Now, they're not all like that. I, I mean, I can tell you that some of them reply and say, we loved your idea, but we had to pick through up hundreds of ideas in your standard rejection letter, um, and then, you know, then maybe you'll get booked. But my point is, that's kind of winging it. There's a whole process involved in getting a TEDx talk. And if you don't know the secrets of the process, if you don't know somebody that has the hacks, we call them in the internet world, then you're going to spin your wheels and you're going to spend a lot of time. 
And to put it in perspective, to finish this all off, in terms of the TEDx world, there's people that have amazing signature stories, brilliant signature stories. Uh, you know, a story like we talked earlier, like Jim Johnson, who has an amazing story. Or Rudy, you know, the Rudy story, people remember it from the football player at Notre Dame. And he was right small and people said he couldn't play. There's people that have national news stories or movies been made about their story that still haven't landed a TEDx talk. And then this guy here, who doesn't have a signature story at all, sneaks in under the radar and lands three of them. Mm. I don't know. The proof to me is in the results. I don't know if there's any more proof than that, that there's secrets to and there's ways that you can hack the TEDx process and increase your odds. Because I proved it. I, you know, three talks in less than four years with a per, as a person who has no signature story at all. And yet, like I say, there's people that should be on that TEDx stage that try, have tried and still aren't getting on there. Uh, another, and one other uh, example is we had a girl whose name is Kelly who joined our program in the pre-launch stage. We had opened it for a pre-launch about a, six weeks ago now. And in week three, she applied what she learned in week one and landed her TEDx talk in three hours. Wow. She's delivering it in June 2019. And she, wow. if you go to her uh, TEDx program page, she's the top testimonial. So anything I ever say to you, I mean, I got it. I would never say it unless I have backup as a testimonial. So that was a long way to say these programs, what they're designed for is the speaking program is designed to help you launch a speaking career or leverage speaking to grow your business or get paid to speak. The TEDx program is what, is what it sounds like. It's to help you secure, deliver, and then leverage. So there's this securing. It's one thing and that's its whole beast on its own. How do you land it? The second part is delivering it because it's a certain style of talk, 18 minutes or under it's delivered in a certain way. And then the final part is leverage it. How do you actually now uh, take this talk that may or may not get viewed thousands of times and actually leverage it to open other doors and earn profit with it. So that's what that program is designed for. So that's the two of them in a nutshell. And, and also, I guess I went into why they were created as well. I love it. And uh, just to let the viewers know, I just checked the price of the book on amazon.co.uk for people who are in the UK. Um, and it's still 99 pence in the UK. So Corey, there's a heads up for you as well. <laughs> okay, awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um, so Corey, this has been absolutely phenomenal. I know time restricts us. I love to stay on and explore more things about the growth mindset and you know putting together a story and how that works and some of your amazing strategies, but time does restrict us. So uh, very quickly before we wrap up, how can people find out more about your book, about your speaking programs, and how can they reach out to you? Awesome. Well, thanks, Talal. And I want to bring you back onto our show. And, and I'm, you know, I'm sure there's an opportunity for us to join back up some way. And, and you know, I can help share those stuff again in the future. Uh, and, you know, maybe dive further into, as you said, the mindset and the common traits I've learned after a lot of interviews. Um, but uh, in terms of how people can connect with me, there's, I'll give two sort of opportunities. One is if you just want to generalize, connect and reach out and say hi and all that kind of good stuff, uh, I would send people to thatspeakerguy.com. So that's speakerguy.com. On there, you'll find our uh, TEDx videos. You can watch my TEDx talks. Um, you'll find articles for Entrepreneur and, and um, Forbes on there. My interviews on Entrepreneur on Fire are on there. So these are ways you can really dive into the work that I'm doing. Uh, there's also the, the speaking program. I think the link for it's on there as well. And, and just other, you know, other little nit, tidbits and stuff and articles. So there's actually a lot of content on there for free. The secondary place I would send people is if the, when we're talking about those programs, if the TEDx program, for instance, speaks to them, is I would send people to the TEDxprogram.com. So the TEDxprogram.com. And like I say, just so I don't confuse you too much, uh, if you want to know about the speaking program, you can either send me a message from the TEDx one, or if you go to the thatspeakerguy.com, I think the link is right on there too. So either of those two places, thatspeakerguy.com, where, by the way, you can also connect with me on social media right from there, or the TEDxprogram.com tells you all about the TEDx program. Uh, I will finish by saying to Talal that the TEDx program, like all good things, that it's only open for certain times a year. So depending on when you're hearing this, it may or may not still be open, but even if it's not, shoot us a message. We'd still like to help you on your journey. We do have lots of free resources. I have a, a speaking-related podcast as well. So there's lots of ways we can help you, and then we can also add you to the waiting list for the next time around. Beautiful. And what's the link to your podcast? Just, just for people who might be curious to listen to the speaking podcast, uh, podcast. So the best way to, to find it, because it's, we have it on a whole bunch of different pages. Um, so I think the best way to find it is if you just um, type in the, for the love of speaking, 
and you can type in my name as well, but if you type in for the love of speaking of my name, you'll get all kinds of different listing options. The reason I say that to all is I found some people don't like listing directly on a website from their mobile, other people can use iTunes, other people can't use iTunes, so I figure the easiest way is if you Google it, you'll find Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, whatever you want. So for the love of speaking is the name of the podcast. You can either type for the love of speaking podcast or add my name in and one of the two will help you find it. Excellent. Well, guys, there you have it. Our conversation with Corey Poirier regarding the public speaking, sorry, the book of public speaking uh, and his programs on TEDx, uh, landing TEDx talks and the public speaking program itself. It's, it, it was just such an amazing experience to read that book and dive deep into the strategies that Corey himself used and other amazing people have used to essentially, you know, build really kind of sustainable businesses behind public speaking. And like Corey mentioned before, public speaking is like the number one fear in the world. Okay, there are not a lot of people who are comfortable in going ahead and delivering those high level talks. And many people don't know how to. Right, especially things like how to land a TEDx talk. I mean, that's huge. Can you imagine that? Like if you land a TEDx talk, what can that, that do for your business, for your company, for your your community? Like whatever it is that you message you want to convey, can you imagine what can what that can do for you and how you can leverage it? But I will highly encourage you to go and check out the book. I will also highly encourage you to go and check out those programs and reach out to Corey. All the links will be below in the description. And as always, guys, thank you so much for spending this time with me. I really appreciate it. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, subscribe to the channel so you can enter the channel competition, which is a monthly competition, which will get you a free entry into uh, basically winning uh, the, the access to my new networking strategy score on how I found, built and maintain relations with really high level people like Corey and others who I've had on the show. So if you want to learn those strategies, make sure you subscribe and uh, just share it forward. Okay. The biggest compliment you can give me and Corey is to just share it with other people who might want to hear these messages, who might be able to benefit from hearing these ideas and these stories. And what what could be better than actually helping other people in your life, in your inner circle, upgrade and accelerate their lives. So with that, guys, thank you so much once again. Corey, pleasure to have you on and maybe we can go for round two sometime. Awesome stuff, Lal. It will be my pleasure. Thank you, brother. Guys, hustle hard, stay awesome, and I'll catch you in the next one.